Hi, and welcome to another episode of Friends with Manners. I'm your host, Lorraine Peters. And boy, are we going to take a break from the normal um, show content tonight. You know, for all of 2020 and part of 2021, we've been talking about nothing but COVID. And I kind of need a break from that. And I have a hunch that you do too. So on tonight's episode, you're going to um, get to see the tables turned on me. Instead of me interviewing my guests, my guests are going to get a chance to not interview me, but ask me questions, questions that maybe they want my professional advice on, if it's something that I'm an expert on, or just my anecdotal opinion. So I hope that uh, you enjoy what my guests have to, uh, to pose to me tonight in forms of questions, and uh, I look forward to having a little bit of fun. So let me see. I want to get started. I will go right from the top of my panel list with France. France, welcome to Friends with Manners. And what is your question? My question is very easy, Lorraine. As we get older, things, our bodies change. Our skin change. We have all kinds of issues with our hair color and things like that. But the biggest thing that I would like to ask this evening is, why is it so difficult when you're over 50 to maintain your weight? It was so easy to lose that five pounds because you were going on vacation. And now it, well, I said, we're not going on vacation, but if we were at March break, why can't we lose it once we go over 50? Thank you. France, oh boy, that is, a, that is a question that me being in the fitness and nutrition business for 30 years and helping people lose weight, uh, maintain wellness, you know, try to stave off things like type two diabetes, or you know, do better with uh, just their overall health. That's the number one question I get uh, from women still today. So there are many things that are going on, but you said women over 50. And so as it relates to getting older and entering the menopause years or the perimenopause, which means before menopause, there is a whole shift, uh, a, a magnificent shift in all sorts of, of the female hormones. And one of those is estrogen. And estrogen is responsible for a whole lot of stuff. And when those levels of estrogen begin to dip and decline, um, when we are done being in our childbearing years, there is a lot of things that happen visibly uh, to our body and also physiologically with how things go on inside your body. On the outside, you can see maybe the thinning of hair, your skin gets up thinner and more crepey like and the texture of it changes so there are those visible outer signs of of you know estrogen decreasing then on the inside what you have happening is you know um we have less muscle mass in our 50s and 60s than we did in our teens and 20s and 30s you really stop um or i should say it becomes more difficult to gain muscle mass over the age of 40, for sure. So even for people who have been, you know, exercise enthusiasts and worked out a lot in their in their teens, maybe as uh, athletes, or in 20s and 30s as exercise enthusiasts, it's great to build that muscle tone because you really do lose it at a marked rate after the age of 40. So here, the reason I'm saying this is very important. Muscle is very important because the more lean muscle mass you have the more calories your body burns off. So when you have less muscle, as you tend to get less as you get older, guess what? Your body can't take in as many calories as it used to because your body's just not going to burn it off. And, um, you know, your metabolism, the rate, what metabolism means is all of your body systems efforts coming forward to, to provide energy those all kind of start to slow down. And so it just becomes more difficult just because of your age to burn as many calories as you once did. And so the biggest piece of advice I give to women like us over 50 is consistency, not perfection, but be consistent. 
France, you alluded to how years ago it was easy to drop five pounds, maybe 10 to get ready for a cruise or a vacation. And that those days are gone. And you're right, those days are gone. However, I don't want to paint a grim picture for women about losing weight after 50. It's just that it takes an element of it being a lifestyle and not a diet. You really do have to approach it like what are the two or three things I can do and do them religiously and consistently and in moderation. Like you might have a piece of pie, but then you're not going to have one every day or you're not going to have two pieces of pie and then, you know, try to take radical measures to lose that in a couple of days. So you want to be more modest and consistent and things like sleep and getting exercise on a regular basis are very important. Sleep, especially again, in those menopausal years is directly tied to weight loss. So I guess to wrap up your question, France, I would say, think of two or three things that you can do consistently and in moderation that are going to just become part of your lifestyle. And once you get the few pounds off that perhaps you want to lose, then you can loosen the strings just a little bit. Thank you very much, Lauren. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay, going straight across the board here, Leanne, what's your question? Hi, Lorraine. Thank you for taking my question this evening. So glad I'm you're here. I'm wondering what advice you would have to give for dressing a body of a certain size. So maybe a lady who's a little bit curvier, if you have any advice on dressing a curvier body. Okay, that's an, I love that. As a stylist, I, I am a certified stylist. And so I think everybody can relate to this scenario. You see something in a store or on the shopping channel or on somebody else and you love it. And so you go and buy it. And then every time you go to put it on, you just don't like it. There's something about it that you can't put your finger on, but you end up taking it off and putting it back in your closet. And then you'll dig it out again another time and go, oh, I love that and I haven't worn it. And so you put it on again, you're like, oh, there's something about this I don't like, but you can't put your finger on it. In styling, everything comes down to one thing, proportion. So if you think of the whole body as 100%, what you're always trying to accomplish is that from your head down to your waist is 50% and from your waist down to your feet is 50%. So everything you buy, you're trying to accomplish that notion of, of evenness of 50, 50, right? So in proportion, I want to give you this example, Leanne, you're very tall. So, you, most people are either long-legged and short torso or vice versa, long torso, short legs. There are some people who are exactly proportioned. Legs are the same proportion as the torso. Uh, they can wear anything. We hate those people. They can wear anything because they're already equal on all fronts. But if you have very long, like if you have long legs and a shorter torso, you would not want to wear some of the trends, uh, for example, high-waisted pants and crop tops. Because if you already have long legs, the high waist makes them even longer. And if you have the short torso, the crop top makes you look even stubbier. Everybody follow me so far? So in that scenario, if you, are, if you have slightly longer legs and a shorter torso, you can afford to give up a little bit of length on the leg and you want to bring the tops down a bit so that you create that evenness. Now let's flip that around. What about the people who have short legs and a longer torso? That would be me. So if you have short legs, you don't want to wear crappy pants because it's going to make my, your legs look even stubbier. So for the shorter legged person, you want the pant to go all the way to the floor. You can wear that slightly higher rise. And then you could wear a slightly shorter top, have it tucked in um, or have something that just falls, you know, below the waistline. So again, it's creating that even proportion. And I promise you that if you focus on clothes that are the right proportion based on whether you are long legged or short legged and, or long torso, short torso. And then the other thing is silhouette. So when you're curvier, when you're bigger, 
bigger is a relative term. When you're, when you're curvier, wearing silhouettes, lines that come diagonally across your body, we've all seen those, right? Asymmetrical zippers on a bomber jacket. There's a reason why when you put those things on, regardless of your size, when you put something on that has an asymmetrical line or an asymmetrical zipper running across your body, you feel good in that for a reason because that's where the eye goes. So when people are looking at you or you look at yourself in the mirror, your eye goes diagonally and curvy across your body versus a line that goes right across your middle, right? We all know what that does. Your eye goes right to it and that's the part that's emphasized. And for a lot of us, that's not the part that we want emphasized. So along with proportion that we just talked about, silhouettes are very important. So um, elongating stripes, uh, those curvy lines or a ruffle going down across the shoulder, right down across the whole body, extremely flattering. And so keep, the, keep those two things in mind, Leanne. The proportion of what you're putting on, does it make you look even? And then those flattering silhouettes. And finally, for dressing the curve of your body, if you are a, a statuesque tall girl like you are, um, make sure that the patterns that you wear match your stature. You don't want to wear tiny, tiny little prints. You want to wear, you can wear, um, not because of your size, because of your height, you can wear big, bold prints, bigger jewelry, you know, that maybe somebody who's very petite couldn't get away with. You can wear those big pieces. I hope that was helpful. Yes, thank you so much, Lorraine. You're welcome. Okay. Beth Keith. There I am. <laughs> Hi. Well, first, thank, thank, thanks for inviting me here. Um, oh, one of the questions I have is in an effort to lose weight, there's actually it's probably a two part question. Um, a lot of my girlfriends that are sort of in the same spot as I am, they want to lose 10, 15 pounds or whatever. Um, some of them are doing like this keto program. And like, I guess I have a question like, is that an effective, is that a good program for people? Or is it just like another fad that comes and goes or I don't know. Right. So, so here's the thing. Keto is a shortened version of the word ketosis, which is what being in a true keto diet plan puts your body into a state of what's called ketosis. I'm not going to get into that because it's very complex. What I see a lot of people doing that they say, oh, I'm on keto, but just visually I'm seeing what they're eating mm -hmm. and they're not on a true keto, and I use quotation fingers, diet. Because true keto diet, to put your body into that ketosis, requires that you eat very, 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 very little carbs. Very little. Not even much more protein. It is predominantly fat. So a lot of people will say, oh, I'm on keto, but they're really not. So it's all kind of a moot point if they're not doing it to the point of putting their body in ketosis. Now, Lorraine, as a person, I don't like it. I don't think it's sustainable. Uh, I, 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 I don't like it for a number of reasons. Does it have some efficacy according to some science? Yeah, but again, most people are not doing it in the true form of, uh, of, of, of putting your body into ketosis. Most people are on a very strict low carb diet. That's what they're on. They're calling it ketosis or they're calling it keto. Most of them are just on a carb restricted diet, which I don't agree with. Uh, carbohydrates are your body's main source of fuel and you need all of those nutrients. You need carbs, you need protein, you need fat. My God, your, your brain is mostly fat. So I am a proponent of eating healthy food you know, one of, the, one of the diets that gets the most universal support right across the board is the Mediterranean style diet. So the olive oils, the vegetables. 
um, that's kind of where I'm at because mm. I always ask myself one question when people come to me, which they have a lot over 25 years, asking me my opinion on this kind of thing. And I always ask myself one question, can I do this for the rest of my life? Is this a product or a food right. or a regimen that I can do for the rest of my life? Because if it's not something that you can incorporate into your way of living, that is a diet. That means it has an end and it's something that you will be moving away from and on to something else. So for me, that's mm -hmm. all success. Can I roll this into my lifestyle forever? And for me, the keto would be a no. Okay. Okay. No, that's, that's good information because I thought if it sounded to me like you ate a lot of fat and a lot of protein. So you kind of cleared that up for me. And it, it sounds like a diet and not a lifestyle, which is not what I'm really looking for. So good. Thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Maria. Hi, Lorraine. Hi, everyone. My question thank is... For, thank you for being on. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So one thing that I've heard a lot is that 2020 was... The breakdown so 2021 is going to be the breakthrough what are your tips for beginning a self-discovery journey and beginning building identity and self-confidence okay so breakthrough and identity and confidence you know if anybody were to say that 2020 did not shake them up in a big way or start to shape us in a big way. I don't know if I could believe them because every one of us on here has experienced something that nobody in a hundred years has experienced and it's still uh, changing and evolving every day. What I found in 2020 is it was, it was easier to adopt a philosophy of, I, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. To try and make any plans or have any, have any uh, assumptions about what tomorrow was going to bring could be very anxiety provoking. And so I think right now, a lot of people's mental health is very fragile and rightfully so. You know, kids are in school one day and not the next. Um, you know, you have a job and then you don't, uh, I'm going to school and now I don't want to because I can't go on campus. I mean, there's nothing about 2020 and 2021 that uh, is predictable and that's very anxiety provoking. So even that term 2021 is the, uh, you know, breakthrough, I think you said, Maria? Yeah, that's what some are saying. Yeah, I would even, I would even caution against that kind of of thought because we don't know if it's going to be the breakthrough right that could just lead to more more disappointment more feeling inadequate and like you somehow didn't accomplish something that would be my fear for people is that they had 2021 made out to be this big rebound only for it to turn out to not be one of the things you know staying away from social media if it's something that makes you not feel good. If you're waking up in the morning with dread and anxiety just about opening up your Instagram or the Facebook, you know, if you can't associate uh, social media with, with building you up and making you feel better, I would say that's something to, to think about. And, you know, some days I get up and I do have to bring it down to the level of this is a good day. I have a house. Uh, I currently don't have to worry about a paycheck. My kids are healthy and I know where they are. Some days it's like, oh my gosh, the sun is shining. I can go out for a walk. Like sometimes you got to bring it down to that lowest common denominator because if you come up too high and your view is too wide, it's overwhelming. It's, it's overwhelming. Um, you know, finding things, we talked about, you know, confidence, um, finding things that fill you up, you know, maybe reading, even if you're not 
historically a, a reader may be diving into uh, a good autobiography that inspires you. I can't say enough about the power of staying inspired by some days little things. You know, I talk to my friends all the time, really strong women and myself included, each and every one of them have had difficulties throughout this at one time or another. So finding things, being purposeful about finding things that inspire you and make you feel good in the moment. But as far as 2021 is going to be the, you know, um, the, the rebound from 2020, I'm not so sure about that. And I'd like to see people not set themselves up for uh, even more disappointment. Gotcha. That was beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Mary. Hello, Rain. Hi, Mary. How are you tonight? Good. I'm awesome. This is so much fun. Awesome. Great. My question um, is in regards to parenting. How do you feel about children having chores, being assigned chores? <laughs> I had a lot of chores growing up and I know how to run a house. I knew how to, how to run a house when I was 18. I know that the floors got scrubbed on the hands and knees. And every two weeks, uh, the shelves over top of the stove get cleaned off and the fridge get cleaned off. I missed the mark big time on this. Uh, I have three kids uh, from uh, 34 to 17. And uh, it, it, it's disgraceful. I, I missed the mark. And I wish I, I wish I had a do-over. I wish I had a do-over just for that, to go back and teach them to do chores and to do the dishes and to do the laundry and to, you know, without belly aching and whining and complaining, or now they're of an age that I would still have to show them how to load the dishwasher. I, full disclosure, I dropped the ball on this one. So if there's any young parent out there, I know that it's easier when you're in the throes of it. You know, I was almost 40 when my two youngest were two and newborn. Uh, it's easier to just do it yourself and get it done. But I'm begging you. I see friends laughing at me right now. I'm begging you, parents, it's worth the investment of time. Make them have chores, age-appropriate chores. When they're two, they can start to put away their own toys. When they're four, they can line up the clothes of their, the boots in the mudroom. When they're six, they can carry the laundry to the... I don't know. All I know is... Whatever works for your family, make sure that your kids have chores to do. Thank you, Lorraine. Thanks, Mary. Okay, I want to come down to Shine, Lacey, and Amber. Hi, girls. What's your question? Hello. Hi, girls. Hello. Okay, who wants to ask me a question? Um, too. We'll go with Amber first. <laughs> Amber, go ahead. My question is, what inspired you to be in the business that you're in? Oh, I love that question. You know, Amber, from when I was two years old, yeah, two, I wanted to be a model. And when I finished high school, I packed my bags and I moved across the country to, to Toronto. I went to a modeling school, much like the one that you come to of mine, and I learned how to model, I learned how to do makeup, and how to dress professionally, and then I did some modeling jobs, I eventually moved back home, and I knew that someday I wanted to have my own modeling school and teach other girls, and that is exactly what I'm doing. Thank you, Amber. You're welcome. Shine, do you have a question? Yeah. If you could meet a celebrity, who would it be and why? If I could meet a celebrity, it would be Oprah. I feel like that is such a generic answer, but it's the truth. I just am so inspired by Oprah, what she does for people and what she does for girls and just how great of a, of a reporter she is. And I love how she interviews people. So it would be Oprah. That's my answer. Thank you, Shine. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you.
Jennifer. Hi. Hi, Lorraine. I love this show. What a great idea. And thanks for including me. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. My question's about getting older, not the physical side, but the emotional side. I'm very fortunate to be so healthy, uh, feeling great, dancing every day at 52. However, there are times when I go, 52? How did that happen? And it's a little scary. And it's a little scary. It's a, almost a loss of identity in some ways. It's almost an, a having to accept a new version of me, a new stage of life. My question then is, how do I let go? How do women uh, or people in general over 50 let go of that fear of aging and simply enjoy life instead of, of fearing that? Jennifer, I think it's almost like a little transition period. You know, uh, if, you, there, if you read some menopause books, a, a couple are coming to my mind. One of the authors talks a lot about how in, when we're younger, we're wired to be very external, to be giving and uh, nurture other people. And we're very outward and our energy is put out into the world for other people. When we get to that age of perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, we are, we are um, genetically engineered. We are rewired in a way to be more internal and to go inward and start focusing on ourselves and our needs. And it's not selfish, and uh, but we get very clear uh, once we make that transition from from younger to post menopause, which is a bit of a transition. Once you get through that transition, you become very clear because you're becoming rewired to be more internal, more nurturing to yourself. And so I think you'll find that over the next few short years, you start to settle into that next phase of your life, which is very exciting. I'm only a few years ahead of you. <laughs> listen everybody we came down to the wire i want to thank you all so much that was so much fun and i hope to have some of you back again have a great have a great day everybody